Thank you. We're here to talk about feelings. <laughs> We work on the Oculus Media team, where we support and build some of the most powerful story experiences in VR today. My name's Yelena Rachitsky. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my favorite part about Oculus Connect is being able to see all my friends in one room. Um, and I'm the executive producer on the team. And I'm Clint Bihari, a product design prototyper, um, l less popular than Yelena. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That was not, I'm not supposed to make that joke. Um, on the media team, we love to talk about stories and games and VR. It's really one of my favorite parts of the job. Everyone there is obsessed. Um, I, I guess like all of you are here today. Um, but ultimately, we're always talking about what experiences we loved, what moved us, what made us cry, what made us laugh, what made us terrified. Ultimately, what experiences are the most powerful? And when we asked other people what their most powerful VR experiences were, we get answers like Notes on Blindness, Disney Cycles, Vader Immortal. And what these all had in common is that they were all tied to emotions. But taking a step back, what are emotions and how do they actually work? Do you actually understand this deeply? There's a lot of research done on this and we're excited to share some of that today. By understanding how our minds and bodies work, we believe that we'll be able to design more emotional VR experiences, and that's why we're here. You know, a lot of past theory saw emotions as this kind of diverse spectrum where there's positive and negative and high intensity and low intensity, and this mapping is sort of hardwired into our brain. But more recent research has shown that emotions are far more diverse, complex, and emergent than originally thought. Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett a leading emotional neuroscientist, has been making strides in the study of emotions. Rather than being born with emotions, which a lot of previous people have thought, Dr. Barrett's research shows that emotions are actually constructed in the moment. They're aided by a lifetime of learning. Emotions actually emerge from experience, and also, they vary based on cultures that we encounter. Let's look at this in detail. So here we have the body and we obviously have sensorial, sensorial inputs. So Dr. Barrett's investigation showed that emotions occur when your brain is making sense of your body's sensations, as well as the context of the world that we're in. So your brain interprets these sensations and then classifies them into emotions and plans based on our past experience and our lives' histories. And that's really the way that your mind prepares your body to take an action. At a macro level, there are even cultural differences around emotions. Russians have a word called toska, which means a sensation of great spiritual anguish, often without any specific cause. Um, I'm Russian, and I can attest to that feeling. Thank you. <laughs> You've probably seen lists of these German words that communicate an honest feeling with no English equivalent. Schadenfreude is, is one of my favorites. Uh, when cultures have words for emotions, they're actually more likely to interpret those situations in that way. So we all kind of see and react to the world through different emotional lenses. So let's walk through a concrete example of how emotions work. So imagine that you're taking a walk through a desert. As you're walking, your brain is constantly taking information and trying to, trying to make sense of what it sees. So you hear this rustling of leaves. Your brain might think it's a snake and it's gonna prepare your body for action to get the hell out of there. <laughs> but, if what you actually see is no snake, then your, body, your brain actually starts correcting itself and corrects its predictions um, for there not being a snake in the bushes, and your body starts calming itself down again. You start making sense of this agitated feeling in some other way. So according to Dr. Barrett's work, our brain is continuously producing predictions and simulations. We experience a world of our own creation, which is pretty fun to think about, and it's held in check by our sensory world, everything we feel, see. Our brain gives meaning to our experiences and sensations through concepts such as emotions. So why are emotions useful for VR experiences? You know, thinking about sensory inputs and world contexts, VR is uniquely exciting because the immersive technology can create more sensory rich worlds for us to journey through. Sensory immersion makes it the most literal medium, more akin to how we experience real life and less abstracted away like movies or books. And as with any medium, emotional experiences have powerful effects on people. 
So considering how to design for them in VR can have huge benefits for our work. We're gonna talk about four of those benefits. Memorability, presence, motivation, and expanding our audiences. Science shows that more emotionally arousing experiences are usually more memorable. Similar to our early anecdotes, people remember the most emotionally powerful moments. And emotion and memory are very tightly intertwined. In fact, the amygdala, which is the emotional center of the brain, is right next to the hippocampus, which is the memory center. And the amygdala actually amplifies the hippocampus to form a more detailed and stronger memory. Research has also shown that place has a very strong role in our memory, and people usually remember the location they were in during a highly emotional moment. VR creates this really strong sense of place, which is a really unique power this medium has. And people actually hack the system in something called memory game competitions. There's actually competitions for people with really great memories, which I'm never gonna be able to compete in. <laughs> Participants are able to remember hundreds of random numbers by creating a memory palace. The technique that they use is to associate each number to an object that is emotionally powerful to them. And they create the scene or story where they walk through the emotional objects in order to remember these numbers in order. It's reverse engineering on how we store emotional, how we store emotional moments in memory, but it's actually the same systems that our brains have evolved to remember. Perhaps a quote sums it up best. In memory of Maya Angelou, people will forget what you said People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Presence is also a hot topic in VR. Presence is a psychological illusion that there is nothing between you and the experience, which we also like to call being there. And presence is not a given in VR. Some people think you put on a VR headset and you're visually immersed, but that's not actually true. When you're emotionally immersed, that's what heavily influences our sense of presence. So we can feel far more present in a great book than a boring VR piece, which I'm sure many of us have felt. Um, back when I lived in New York, I remember I would miss my subway stop because I was completely immersed in a good book. And I, there would be so many sensory moments. <laughs> I'm sure most of you have probably been on a New York subway and you can tell that there's a lot of strong senses. So that says a lot for being emotionally immersed. <laughs> So researchers have shown that the connection between the two in a variety of studies. So as soon as a VR experience engages our emotions, presence is increased. Even studies that have manipulated emotion separately from the content demonstrate this effect. So in the experiment, when people are more emotionally aroused outside of VR, when they go into VR, they report more presence. Our emotional involvement makes us much more susceptible to presence. So it's really important that we make our work evocative. So this third one is often discussed in design, but not always broken down clearly, motivation. Since emotions tell our body what to do, they also motivate our audiences. We see this a lot in games. The challenges increase, as does our ability to play the game, and when these are balanced, we experience flow, where we feel immersed, we lose track of time, and we wanna keep playing and playing and going. But an important distinction around motivation is intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation comes from within, People are motivated to do something based on that activity's inherent satisfaction. So in this image, someone has an intrinsic motivation to express themselves, and one way they pursue that is by customizing their outfit with some really sweet boots and cool wings and stuff like that. That's not my avatar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that. Extrinsic motivation comes from external pressures and rewards. Games obviously use this a lot with scores and badges and other feedback. So when a user is battling a dragon to get points in a trophy, that's extrinsic. These are valuable strategies to motivate audiences, but we'd like to talk about intrinsic motivation a bit more. Different types of people have different intrinsic motivations, so a wide audience that we all want for VR will require a diverse range of emotional experiences. One of the most robust personality types tests in psychology is the big five. People are ranked across five dimensions, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and my favorite, neuroticism. <laughs> and Quantic Foundry, a really cool gaming market research company, has built an, these really fascinating frameworks around gamer motivations. So their list is action, social, mastery, achievement, immersion, and creativity. But they've also done some really cool studies where they show how people's personalities 
correlate to different genres and motivations. You know, in gaming, we often have a lot of action and mastery and achievement, but by focusing more on social collaboration, not just competition, and creative expression, we'll create experiences that intrinsically motivate audiences who previously really weren't even that interested in games. The Sims is an awesome example of that. At the time of its release, it seemed to come out of nowhere, an anomaly that was incredibly popular with women and went on to become one of the biggest selling PC games of all time. It was focused on social roles, social interaction, and customization, with little competition or challenges to master. What are social experiences for people who are agreeable and conscientious? How can we design for feelings of cooperation and collaboration instead of competition and conquering? Journey on PlayStation is a great example here. They align the best extrinsic rewards with intrinsic collaboration. Half and half that just came out, another awesome example. What are creative experiences for people who are highly open-minded? How can we design for feelings of wild expressiveness beyond avatar gear? We want to emphasize this final point. Designing for a broader emotional base will appeal to broader audiences. Our medium will grow beyond gamers to a bigger and wider range of people like movies and books and other mediums. There are countless untapped audiences who could love VR if only we catered to their emotional interests. I personally love this investigation of science and how we work, but how do we connect these te techniques that we use in VR? In, this title, in the title of this talk, we mention storytelling and games and the space where they meet. So what does that actually mean? When we say storytelling, this implies that the creator is telling the story that the audience is going to experience. This is more straightforward with linear stories like books and movies, where you're experiencing the exact narrative arc the creator had for your journey. And then there are games. These are much more interactive and the creator is more of a world builder. This gives space for audiences to enter these interactive systems and experience their, their own narrative arcs and journeys. So playing a game I suck at is a far more tragic story to experience than someone who is playing a game masterfully. And the more interactive a game is, the less control a creator has over the audience's exact experience, which is very challenging. VR spans this place between storytelling and games. And we're gonna dive into some examples that show really interesting techniques around designing for emotion. The examples we're gonna dive into today are Traveling While Black, Notes on Blindness, Wolves in the Walls, Moss, and VR Chat. These are wonderful, emotionally powerful examples across the spectrum. So we asked these creators how they design for emotion. There was a really wide range of responses, but we identified five themes we think are important to discuss. These are by no means comprehensive, mutually exclusive, or required in a project when designing for emotion, but they're intriguing to consider when building stuff like this. The five themes that emerged were first person perspective, space, scale, and distance, the audience's journey, ludonarrative alignment, which is a mouthful, we're gonna to get to that, uh, visual and audio aesthetics. So from an interaction standpoint, VR is inherently a first person perspective. In VR, we map the user's gaze input to the virtual world output. The user doesn't need to actually be a character in the, or a role, but they're gonna be looking around and feeling present in that world. So if the user does have a role or avatar, they can feel much more intuitively involved and much more influential in the experience. We have evolved for face-to-face -face interaction. So eye contact, proximity, personal space, they carry more weight in VR. On this second point, beyond any other medium or field, space, scale, and distance are powerful properties in VR. Even architecture and theater and other amazing spatial art forms they're still limited by physics. VR is digital, so we have control over space, scale, and distance in ways we've never had before. Again, not required, but there are powerful elements in your palette to evoke emotion, and you'll see some really clever techniques in some of the examples. Those last two are uniquely expressive affordances of the medium, and by affordance, we mean something that is intuitive for people to experience. But taking a step back to the craft of stories, We've all seen the three-act narrative arc for stories, like in Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. It's not the only story structure, but it really is a quintessential example of the audience's journey. If there are no ups, no downs, no change, no surprise, no drama, there isn't really much of a story, and it's not that much fun. Linear storytellers, they know this well. 
but when you get to inter interactive projects, they don't require traditional story structure to be engaging. So the examples that we're gonna discuss today manage to craft an emotional journey for audiences while still giving the user autonomy to choose their journey, which is a very difficult thing to do for those of us in here who are doing it. The challenge for interactive is to give that space, but also maintain a fluid experience. And that brings us to our next point. So ludonarrative alignment. This word, ludonarrative, Yelena likes to tease me that this is my favorite word. <laughs> it's true, it is my favorite word. I ramble constantly about this. Um, this term was actually coined in a 2007 blog post by Clint Hawking, critiquing the game Bioshock. Ludology refers to interactive play. Narrative obviously refers to story. For many incredible games, classic series like Mario and Metal Gear Solid, there's a clear distinction between the cutscenes that progress the story and the interactive moments where you're actually kind of having fun. Um, but if the, if the princess is kidnapped by Bowser in a cutscene, why am I wandering around going down pipes trying to find secrets? You know, I love the Mario series, and it's a lot of fun wandering around discovering stuff, but it doesn't really seem that aligned with rushing to rescue the princess. Sometimes late in the game, I'll deliberately not rescue the princess so I can get more secrets, which really doesn't seem that smart. But, you know, Nintendo isn't trying to sell us on some deep story. The princess has been kidnapped like 500 times. Um, <laughs> like a security team or something at that point. So anyway, this is what game designers call ludonarrative dissonance, but today we'd like to talk about the opposite, when the story and the interactive mechanics are aligned. If a story is just an emotional sequence of information, how can the narrative arc rise and fall based on interactive mechanics, not just linear story moments? How can we seamlessly blend interactivity and story progression to feel like a fluid experience? And finally, there are the aesthetics. Over time, most mediums have arisen to communicate with more of our senses, from oral tradition to printed word, black and white TV, color TV, bigger screens, surround sound, and the list goes on and on. VR is the most visually rich digital medium yet. And we also have the addition of spatialized sound, which is a great bonus. The most prominent senses that humans have is visual, and audio is a close second. In an interactive medium, the world is very important. Since users have autonomy to uniquely look, go, and feel their way through an environment, using visual design and spatial audio can obviously set the tone, but more importantly, it can actually guide the user to key moments in your story. So starting on the linear end of the spectrum, we have Traveling While Black from Felix and Paul Studios and Roger Ross Williams. This is a really powerful documentary. It's available now. I hope you've all been able to see it. Um, and in this project, we learn about the Green Book. And the Green Book is a survival guide, which was first published in 1936. And it was for African-American travelers, which they relied on this to avoid discrimination. It listed safe spaces that would fulfill their basic needs. In 1958, Ben and Virginia Ali's new restaurant, Ben's Jilly Bowl, joined that list. And this is where a lot of the VR scenes take place. So it combines first-person perspective and space. Traveling While Black uses VR to sensorially immerse us in a new place and sit with people who actually experienced the discrimination at that time. The team cleverly placed the camera in a small booth in Ben's. So while we've read history books and we've watched news stories on TV, we've rarely had the chance to sit intimately with people who have experienced racism over the decades in the places that they experienced them and hear their personal stories face to face. Another powerful design technique used by Felix and Paul was how they changed their environment magically to, communi to communicate the sense of history. So even with the low interactivity, because this was mostly a 360 video of looking around, they used the mirror on the wall beside the audience as a portal to different times and places. We witness this juxtaposition of the past and present in the same place. We're in a trusted personal space with a seat at the table. This allows us to listen and reflect on the history of the social issue in the most visceral way possible through media today. Moving further, slightly towards a higher interactivity, the next example we're gonna talk about is Notes on Blindness, which some people call the Citizen Kane of VR. Um, it was made four years ago and it still stands the test of time, which is incredible. Notes on Blindness is a really powerful story around theologian John Hull, who loses his sight and records it on audio cassettes over time. The creator used, used, used interactivity in a really clever way throughout without losing the narrative pacing. They relied on first-person perspective and a really imaginative use of space. So we're able to have, as, 
as users, we're able to have pseudo experience of the blind perception. So by looking around at the sounds of a blind person hears, audiences are actually able to experience a blind person's technique of spatially placing objects from what feels like first person. The emotions that emerge out of this are feelings of isolation, reflection, and perception. There's this really heartfelt line from John Hull where he describes what a beautiful day is for most people, which is a sunny day. He says, the world is a light in your eyes in a sunny day. And I tend to agree, and that's why I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> but for the visually impaired, a beautiful day is actually a windy day because the wind creates these sound vibrations everywhere. So a blind person hears and therefore sees the rustling of the leaves as wind sweeps through. The world is much more sonically alive on a windy day. And I'll never forget experiencing this in VR while John narrated this insight. And you can see some of it in this video where it comes alive visually for us. And this was a very touching moment, listening while experiencing. It was, it was elegant, subtle, ludonarrative <laughs> alignment. If the interactions were complex, I may have been overwhelmed and ignored the voiceover. But the simple interactions that they had, they worked together to showcase this emotional narration. They also allowed a wide variety of audiences to understand and experience this world without complex mechanics, which is really important for expanding your audience. Going deeper into interactivity, Wolves in the Walls by Fable Studio is a fantastic example of bridging the space between storytelling and games. In this project, you have an explicit role, you're Lucy's imaginary friend, and they use first person to great effect here. Lucy draws you into existence at your regular height, but then, in one of my favorite scenes, she erases you and redraws you at her height. It's such a simple idea to manipulate scale and perspective, but it puts you eye to eye with Lucy like you're a fellow kid. By having a role, they allow you to be Lucy's peer. She's your partner, and you bond with her throughout the story. This actually kind of aligns with a really interesting theory called social penetration theory. You bond with people often through layers of revelation, with the ultimate relationship depth achieved through shared vulnerability. One fascinating emotional roller coaster of a scene is when Lucy invites you to draw on the walls with her. You're collaborating with her in this fluid transition from story to interaction to the next story beat where Lucy's mom bursts into the room to scold you for drawing on the walls. This scary and vulnerable moment with Lucy is shared and the emotional bonding with her deepens. You didn't simply witness Lucy get in trouble, you are a co-conspirator and you share the same fate. Kind of like getting in trouble with some of your best friends in high school. <laughs> I don't know what your high school life was like. <laughs> uh, when describing how they emotionally designed sequences like these, the creators talked about doubling Lucy's mom's size to amplify the feelings of fear and authority. They talked about placing Lucy's father farther away when he was emotionally distant. These mappings of scale to power and distance to intimacy are both intuitive and profound. The combination of story beats and interactions are fluid. I'm not impatiently sitting through story cutscenes waiting to get back to the fun interaction. I know some people love cutscenes. The emotional sequence aligns the characters, interactivity, and the world space to evoke emotional investment with Lucy. One of our favorite examples of Ludo narrative alignment is Florence. If you haven't played this mobile game yet, please go play it. Without any words, we experience love and heartbreak through interactions entirely. No explanation, just sublime mechanics aligned with our deeper emotions around love, relationships, and their challenges. Here, the player is trying to put together the puzzle pieces of a relationship, but it's futile. They keep drifting apart. Much like a relationship, you're struggling to save, but it just won't happen. This game is amazing. There's so many beautiful little narrative moments like this. Please, everyone out there, Make games like this in VR. I'm working on stuff. I'd love to hear what you're doing. Uh, video games have been around for decades, and there have been many attempts in this direction, but I really put Florence on a pedestal for how well they pulled off their alignment of the mechanics to the story. It's my soapbox moment. There's a false dichotomy between story and interactivity. If you carefully design interactions that em evoke emotions aligned with your story's emotional beats, you'll create fluid, powerful, experiential stories. Now, Moss, one of my favorite games, is the first one on the spectrum to be commonly categorized as a game. Moss is an adventure where you collaborate with and sort of semi-control a small mouse named Quill. 
There are so many adventure games out there where you control a character from third person, and many of them are amazing. But in VR, from first person perspective, looking down at Tiny Quill, you feel more present in that world, and you're given a role as her collaborator and friend. Quill looks up at you, communicates with sign language, gives you hints. You can reach down and touch her to soothe her and give her energy. You move large objects out of the way and she thanks you. It's an intimate collaboration with a friend that has her own spirit and motivations, not distantly controlling a character from third person. Similar to Wolves in the Walls, social penetration theory occurs where you bond over time and endure hardships together. Unlike Wolves in the Walls though, where Lucy draws you at her height to treat you as a peer, Moss has an extreme mismatch of scale. Quill is tiny, cute, and brave, but still a delicate little mouse. The audience is huge in comparison. The developers at Polyarc told us that while making the game, people cared for Quill so much they were brought to tears. Why do people love Quill so much? One reason. <laughs> There's a fascinating theory <laughs> called the baby face bias. The more something has childlike features, big eyes, round, small nose, round cheeks, small jaws, etc., the more they seem innocent but clueless. And when someone has adult-like features, a strong jaw, smaller slanted eyes, an angular nose, the more we see them as knowledgeable but less innocent. And this actually happens in courtrooms where juries are more likely to presume baby-faced suspects are innocent. Quill taps into this baby-faced bias to be someone you want to care for, defend, and support. It's why people love dogs and cats so much, but puppies and kittens are even cuter. <laughs> Polyarch talked about tapping into the nostalgia for raising a pet. It's so delightful how their designs elicit these feelings from childhood, similar to Wolves in the Walls, but tweaking the levers of space for a whole different emotional relationship. Going back to that courtroom example for a second, though, there's an interesting paradox. If those baby-faced suspects are proved irrefutably guilty, they're actually sentenced more harshly than adult-faced criminals. It's because we trusted them and got close to these cute babies. And when they turn out to be evil, we have that much more distance to recoil from. On the innocence scale, it goes good baby, good adult, evil adult, evil baby. <laughs> <laughs> evil baby is the worst thing, right? This is why we see so many children in horror movies, The Exorcist, Chucky, Children of the Corn, etc. All that's to say, we should be considering this paradox more in VR. We keep making bosses bigger and bigger, and the final boss is the biggest. But what if the climax was based around someone tiny, cute, and evil? <laughs> How creepy. I don't want to spoil The Crow by Baobab, but they use this scale reversal to great effect in one of my favorite scenes. And here we are at the end of the spectrum, one of the most fascinating examples in not only VR, but in recent digital culture, VR chat. I've had some wonderful, bizarre, hilarious experiences in VR chat. It's really hard to describe. I bet there's some sort of German word <laughs> for this feeling. It's a wildly open virtual social sandbox. One end of the spectrum from creator's story to audience's story, this lives at the very tip of the audience's story. So how did creators or VR chat create such powerful moments while giving all control to the user? Two main things, self-expression and socializing. Jesse Jowdry, the creator of VRChat, believes that real people are the cause of almost all human emotions, and in VR, those emotions are not lost. A core intrins intrinsic motivation to us all is socializing. What's more is that people are able to fully express themselves, step outside their reality, and where unexpected events can happen regularly. These are the necessary mechanics for the most highly emotional experience. It's why people love Burning Man so much. <laughs> Whoop. Being your most expressive self in a participatory world. There's no single mechanic for this. Jesse believes that implementation of every mechanic must be biased to support this behavior. behavior. Similar to TikTok and YouTube, everyone is adding their experience and affecting other experience. A continuous journey that doesn't have a clear end. Some of the best moments we've observed of VR chat come from this user named Searmore. It's S Y R. M-O-R, hard to pronounce. He has become a sort of virtual therapist, and there are really deep, heartbreaking, joyous, tragic human conversations and interactions happening in Seermore social meetings, and he shares some of them on YouTube. A huge emotional longing in our society is it's around meaningful connections. 
So here's a giant mushroom telling a story to Sear Moore. A little bit. So even though it looks funny, this is actually very meaningful. He talks about the struggle, the struggle of raising a family while also having ALS. In another story, there's also a young man from South Korea whose avatar is a small, cute bird. And he made his avatar a small, cute bird because he hoped that it would make him feel more approachable and easy to talk to. And in the video that Sear Moore had with him, people felt so connected to him that they actually pulled together and raised money to help bring, them, bring him to the US to follow his dreams. So there's really meaningful connections that come from this. And these are captivating examples of how social media will evolve in the sensory-rich medium of VR. We personally feel lucky to witness and support these types of explorations. So all of the themes we've spoken about are really important techniques to consider. And as we talked about in the beginning, if you keep these in mind, you can make your experience more memorable, create more presence, motivate your audiences, and more importantly, expand our audiences, which we all need to do. The main point that we hope you get out of this is that in order to design for humans, we need to understand how humans work. And our biggest driver is our emotions. And taking a big step back again, everything we feel and see, this is all information that's coming into our body, whether it's a book, VR, or what you're seeing right this second. But ultimately, emotions are the most powerful ways we can organize information. So, by designing for a variety of emotions, we'll grow this medium to cater to everyone in the way that we all know is possible. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.